don't cut over or something I haven't answered, please let me know. Um, okay, will do. Uh, yeah, but uh, okay, so I mean, um, basically, um, you know, it, it just basically talks out here somebody with the uh, halitrigidus, uh, you know, people argue whether it's stage two, stage three. Um, uh, regardless, I mean, I, I just show a picture of a total toe. Um, Maynard Key says, you know, everybody wants to do um, uh, fusion. And, you know, we, if you look at our, our history, uh, 10 years ago, everybody said ankle fusion was the gold standard. And now if you go to the meetings, it's all who's got the best ankle replacement. And, right. and nobody even talks about fusion anymore. So, I mean, the same thing here. Um, I think where where um, it got a bad rap, um, uh, arthroplasty, as you know, we did a lot of phalangeal sided stuff and it really didn't work. And 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 Arthur Service, uh, like back in 2004, said, well, metatarsal head's the worst part. Why don't we resurface that? Because um, they were doing it with shoulders and hips. And uh, they came up with this. So, you know, this was the first generation. I'll just run you through the, uh, if, you, if you look at some of the literature, they talk about subsidence. And because after Arthur Service created the metatarsal head resurfacing, it became very popular. And a lot of... Uh, People tried to imitate it and the stems, gotcha. uh, they tried to go with stems, screws and things like that. And we saw a lot of subsidence. Uh, I can tell you, I definitely have put in over a thousand of these things in over the 14 years that I've been playing with it. And I've never seen the metatarsal side subside. Um, uh, I've had a couple loosen from infections and things like that, but I've never seen subsidence. And, um, and I think it's the taper post. I think that's the secret uh, to this is that that force coated uh, taper post. So as okay. you know, the first okay. post we, we 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 made it was flat. Um, and then actually, uh, we talked about doing things like excising bone around the implant, doing decompressions, uh, doing a Moberg or some type of phalangeal osteotomy, basically trying to get more motion because we weren't getting as much motion as we wanted. Everybody's talking about doing uh, soft tissue in a position on top of it, soft tissue releases. But, uh, you know, as you, you saw, some of these other implants uh, that imitated the metatarsal, like this subsided, this was shown to subside, this subsided. So far, that taper post has kept this, I think, from subsiding. One thing we did change, though, and I'll go to this, um, Tom C. Giovanni and some of the people went back and started looking at the kinematics. And what they found is the, the kinematics of the first MTP joint in stance and then in gait, it almost like has two different arcs of motion. So what they did is they went to the lab and found that, you know what, uh, we need a second uh, arc of motion for toe off because we're trying to decrease that impact that you see on the dorsal side. So that, that was really why the DF came about. Plus the other truth is, is some of the podiatrists wouldn't do a chylectomy and they'd leave this huge spur on the top of the phalanx after they put the implant in and just kind of forced them to do their, their uh, chylectomy or shave the top part. Gotcha. And so that was really uh, the idea behind the second generation and why we created it. Um, mostly from some of the old work and, and Tom San Giovanni's down in Florida's work. Um, and that's why we created it. And then as the years went along, we saw this worked really well against the phalanx, but then we started, just like with the hemiarthroplasty of the hip, you started seeing acetabular wear. Well, over about 10 years, we started seeing phalangeal wear. And so we realized that, that we had to come up with something for the phalanx side. And and the phalanx side, I, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna be dead honest with you. Um, I've seen a few of these loosen. I probably put in uh, 100 to 150. And, and some of them loosened. And so the, the changes that came about in the past year were making the, uh, uh, basically the metal backing on the phalangeal side uh, porous coated and making the stem porous coated and getting rid of the cannula at the tip. Because that's where we were starting to see licenses right here where the cannulated tip was. Um, and so those are some changes they made in the past year just to get uh, better bony ingrowth. Um, I could say since I put in the new stem in, I haven't seen some of that lysis that I've seen in uh, recently. Um, so I, you know, I, I teach people. I say, look, they ask me, what do I do? Uh, I'll be honest with you. What I do is I go in, got somebody with halitrigidus. I talk about, you know, 
I can go in, clean it up, or put an implant in, or fuse it. And obviously, I usually pick the former ones. So I I consent everybody for colectomy versus uh, arthroplasty, right? Um, the but in all honesty, um, if I get in there and and the median lateral sides are destroyed as well as the central side, then then I go to a, a hemiarthroplasty, um, and I'm gonna jump all the way back to where I was at. Um, what I do is 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 for me if I don't do the cartiva, um, I uh, I do the uh, hemiarthroplasty, and then if the hemiarthroplasty um, is not enough and the phalangeal side is too bad, then I'll even do the total toe. Um, and then if it's too too advanced, where you know for me I still do my gout, uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, those people still get fusions. Because okay. I, I don't think any implant's going to work on gout or um, you know any of the systemic disorders. I think you know this is a good implant for osteoarthritis, classic Alex rigidus. Is um, they're coming up with the boss screw, which is going to be interesting. So right now I've taken a couple cartivas out and converted them to uh, uh, hemiarthroplasty, um, and and it's kind of neat. And I'll show you. Um, in a second so they're actually these things actually believe it or not i don't know if you've taken any of them out yet but they, they when you go in they pop right out they, they're really like there's no bony and growth or anything like that and a lot of times they come out so incredibly easy because um the um they almost have loosening around them so then you're kind of left with this defect uh when you do the cartiva what i've done is i've found that prior to this next thing i'm going to show you what i would do is I found the post would actually get past this hole. So I'd get uh, probably three or four threads into good bone. And then I would fill this in with cement, um, just calcium phosphate cement. And, and that worked okay. But then that's where this new screw came out called the boss. And the idea behind the boss is it's actually gonna have an eight or 10 millimeter ring. So you can see it, uh, there's gonna be, it's gonna be a porous coated ring here. And it's also going to have these gaps for bone to grow into it. And it's actually going to be a little bit longer so that it'll actually give good purchase. So that that actually is what it's going to look like. It's going to go in and actually fill the hole. And it's pretty neat because I actually created holes in just about every direction you can. 10 millimeter hole, Cartiva holes. And and this boss screw got purchased in every direction I, when I, I, I was able to just put it down the pipe and, and that that ring on the outside just grabbed a great purchase so i think it's going to be a nice uh, revision when you're doing when the cartivas start failing instead of taking them out and using them um and that's actually right there's the boss and then that's what it looks like after you uh, put the hemi cap in so that was a cartiva that was revised uh to a hemi cap um so that's kind of what it looks like pre-op and then there's what it looks, looks like uh with the 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 implant in. Um, pretty good big scope. The other thing to me, and, and this is something you can appreciate, um, to me the most important part of this surgery is the soft tissue releases. Um, just like if you do a total knee, we don't just go in and pop the components in and get out of there. We you know, release a varus deformity, we release a valgus deformity. And so soft tissue balancing, in my opinion, is very important. Um, the disease is caused by a contracture of the plantar surface of the soft tissue. So for me, I think it's really important you have to release all those soft tissues. So I'm just gonna show you my technique and how I do it. Um, I make my dorsal incision and then there's the EHL and I try to keep it in its sheath. If not, you know, I, I just pull it out of the way. So that exposes my dorsal capsule. Once I, I basically put the EHL protected behind my wheel lander, then I have the capsule. I just make, I literally go straight down the capsule um, and split it. And then once I've split it, um, I will peel it. And what I'm literally going to do is peel it all the way down median laterally, just like when we take down uh, the contractures in a, to a total knee. Actually, the way I think of this is an upside down knee um, where the, the patella is on the bottom um, and the contracture, instead of being a flexion contracture, is really a, more of an extension contracture. But um, I take my knife, once I have my capsule peeled on medial lateral sides, and I do take down the collateral ligaments on both sides, 
I'll actually take my knife and sl slip it right under this groove and literally run it straight along. So I'm literally I'm periosteally stripping the collateral ligaments on both sides of the neck. And what I do is I take, I have this curved uh, osteotome type device. Uh, some people use them a glamoury. And you'll notice I put it right behind the metatarsal head. So I'm kind of past the articulation. And, and this thing's actually neat because you can wedge down on the, um, on the proximal phalanx, so you can get it in there. And I literally run this up. Um, uh, Naomi Shields came up with that idea of um, in Kansas, where you can get this gouge behind and release the uh, basically the plantar plate off the metatarsal head. The idea is you can see how deep I've actually penetrated. I mean, I go up to about mid shaft on on medial lateral and plantar, so the whole plantar surface I strip. And then once I've done the uh, the metatarsal head side, if I'm doing a total toe, uh, if I'm just doing a hemicap, that's what I do. Um, but so for me, once it's gotten this advanced, I mean, I know that I'm going to have plantar contractures. And I've, I've, you know, I've, I've, like I said, I've, this is a technique I've, I've developed over 14 years. Um, I, I get pretty aggressive. I, I do a lot of stripping. Um, and I, I've not, everybody asks me, don't you see AVN? No, because of the uh, intraosseous blood supply. I mean, obviously nobody in their right mind would do this and then cut the metatarsal head because you're guaranteed it's dead. Um, sure. But I, I start like this and I, uh, that intraosseous blood supply keeps this uh, well preserved. Um, but I do this strip and then if I'm going to do the total toe, believe it or not, I'll actually peel it just like this. Basically what I tell, teach my fellows is, is this is the femur and this is the tibia. So I'm literally going to start peeling the, the hamstrings off of the tibia. I am literally going to peel the plantar plate off this side. And then once I do that, I take my cob. I'm going to strip almost about a centimeter uh, on the, the phalanx. And, and the reason is Sam LeBee about memory showed that you can do this safely and you don't get cock up toe because the FHL actually sends strips um, to the uh, 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 FHB, um, and so that you don't get cock up deformities as long as you're staying up against the the plantar surface. Uh, and and gotcha. this is basically, you know, it's the same thing we do for a, a total knee when we um, have a, a hamstring contracture. Um, and so we don't see it. And so you can see I strip it pretty good. Now, once I've done that, before I ever put an implant in, uh, I have you know 90 degrees of dorsiflexion. Um, between the metatarsal and the toe. So for me, if I, I, I release until I get that. And, and almost always, if you do the release I just showed you, um, it works real well. And then um, the technique for me is, I, uh, I'm not going to beat this too much, but uh, I put my guide pin down. Uh, I put the, the I, when I put my uh, guide on, uh, that, that first guide, I make sure that the I don't give a damn about the medial, lateral, or dorsal sides. All I care about is that plantar surface because I want to make sure that when those sesamoids come up, um, that they're not going to hit against that implant. So I try to make sure I'm flush with my surface. So that bottom guide sits, uh, really con conforms with the plantar surface of both the sesamoidal grooves. And, and usually I find that once I put it there, then I just fire my pin and I'll, I'll once I have my starting point, I fire my pin so that it goes down the shaft in the AP and lateral planes. A long time ago, I was getting x-rays. Now, I, I can pretty much eye it up pretty easily. And then uh, I'm not going to beat up too much on the, the actual technique, but you, you know, you, you ream down till you're flush. You're going to tap. You're going to put your post in, and then you're going to put your implant in. I think what I'll show you is, is the, the, the important the pearls on my technique. Once I have my, my cap in place, and what I actually do is I take a saw and I'll, I'm going to remove the, the, any bad cartilage on either side because, you know, we don't leave articular surface on a, a distal femur when we do it. So I actually will take my a saw and I'll remove it. But what I do is I angle it. I angle it backwards um, from the edge of the implant backwards and I make sure that I leave my sesamoidal grooves alone. I don't want to create an unstable situation for the sesamoid. So you'll see I've shaved the medial eminence, but I've kind of left just that groove so that sesamoid will sit in its groove the way it's supposed to. Then once I do that, I take off my spurs off of the uh, phalangeal base. 
mostly to get a good shot. Um, and so once I have all my osteophytes removed, then I, I, I personally put it right down the shaft. Best way is to think of it as a, 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 if you had a real bad deformity of a tibia here, and right. you, you're going to stem a tibia, you're going to put it right down the shaft of the tibia and the, let the stem, and if there's a deformity here, and I'll show you some things I've done when you have this kind of really angled bad head, because um, I've really been pushing the limits with uh, how much I can do with this, but I make sure this thing's down the shaft. So um, I do use x-ray every single time um, to make sure I'm down the center of the uh, phalangeal side. And the reason is, if you think about it, it's a real broad base here, but it becomes very narrow in here. And, and I've had my fellows blow out the bottom with the pin and things like that. Um, so I make sure if I err, uh, I x-ray every single time to make sure I'm down the shaft before I drill. And then technically you're going to drill and, and then you're going to tap and then you're going to put the post down. And if you'll notice, interestingly, there, I'm going to show you a case in a little bit, but, but you'll have a, sometimes you have, I have so much wear um, that I have a little bit of thread exposed. And then what I'll do is I'll fill this with calcium phosphate cement. And I'll show you some pictures and a little bit of that. Um, but then I put my uh, trial on. Now, this is interesting because this is the one thing I still have yet to understand. Um, I, I, I put a one millimeter. So you've seen the soft tissue release. I put a one millimeter poly in and then I dorsiflex and it comes up 90 degrees. Great. Then I put in a two millimeter thick poly. So I've only increased the thickness of the poly by a millimeter. And when I do that, I, I lose about. 30 degrees of my dorsiflexion. I, I don't know why one millimeter makes such a big difference, but every time I play with it, it happens. Um, I don't I don't know. I cannot explain that one to this day. And nobody really has been able to explain that one. But it does. So so I actually, in that case, I go back down to the one because as you and I both know, nobody has ever come back and said, you know, nothing to be emotional. Right, my, that's right. My toe is too loose. Um, they all come back stiff. So once I once I actually put my toe and my components in, then I actually do. I peel. I, I pull my whole capsule back together. So here's my EHL hanging. But you'll see, I took both sides that I peeled down, and I I, I make it nice and snug. If there's redundant capsule or anything, I, I remove it, and then I do. I close my capsule back down over top, and then uh, uh, then I just you know, close my skin like we all do. Um, but there's my EHL sitting, my capsule's nice and closed at the end. And then I, I just use a typical post-op dressing like we all do, um, you know, just well-padded yeah. uh, wrap and all that. This is just an interesting thing that, that they created. These are polyethylene bands. And, and are, you, uh, uh, are, you, uh, are you putting them into a splint or a boot? I mean, what's the... Nope. The, yeah, they, they you, get a post-op shoe. And, okay. and I tell them, you know, uh, I, put, I put basically just, uh, you know, four by fours and Webrel and an ace wrap. And then I just give them a post up shoe and I tell them when you're, you know, once your popliteal block wears off and you can feel your foot, um, I want you up walking on it. And I actually want you to take the post up shoe off. And what I tell them is in their house, uh, walk around with just your dressing on. Um, and, and pretend that you're a ballerina and go up on your toe, stretch your toe right away. Um, but when you go outside, you, you know, you have to wear the post-op shoe because nothing's going to fit. And I actually have them do that for two weeks. I don't see them back for two weeks. Um, and then, then because at two weeks, then typically I can get the, the stitches out. I just do a, uh, either if it's a woman, I, a lot of times I'll do a running sub Q on the top. If it's a, a guy, uh, I'll just do a running baseball stitch. Um, okay. That that's measure. Or some people, you know, you can use an interrupted nylon, whatever. Um, but I do. I, I literally want them out of the shoe when they're at home and, and really trying to bend and move that toe. Um, t I guess my thought is that um, you know we don't hold a knee still for two weeks, and people say don't you have wound problems? But if you think about it, you're actually when you bend the toe, you're taking tension off of your <laughs> wound your repair so that makes sense it's more the the implant for me but you're treating it like a total knee and we walk on that immediately so absolutely same thing 
And then the nice thing about the total, uh, well, unfortunately with the total knee, you're actually bending on your incision. So you're stretching your, stressing your incision. Yeah. But with this, when you walk, you're not stressing, you're taking the tension off. Um, so yeah, I, I'm very, very aggressive with my range motion and, and knock on wood, I, I, I find that that works a lot better um, uh, because they don't come back stiff. And then what I do is at two weeks, I see them, make sure the wound's okay, and then uh, I literally uh, just have them put, uh, you know, a bandaid, a square bandaid over the incision, and and I get them in a regular shoe and have them start therapy at two weeks, um, uh, it, to try to, you know, get as much motion and strength back as they can. This is kind of an interesting thing. So Greg Berlet, uh, uh basically, if you ever remember, back in 2006, foot and ankle surgery, he talked about the boxing glove technique. So he was talking basically what he was doing, take graft jacket and literally wrapping it around the metatarsal head um, uh, and uh, uh, like a boxing glove. And, and he was doing it and he was having really good uh, results uh, in terms of pain and range of motion. But what, what Greg said is the problem with it is, is that the head just, the head just continued to deteriorate. And so a lot of uh, hallux, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of hallux varus and a lot of hallux valgus. So he kind of abandoned the technique because of deformities in the uh, uh, coronal plane. Um, but he said it was amazing. So so I kind of adopted that because what I do is if I have somebody, as I said, I'm really pushing the limits that has bad sesamoid arthritis. Once I put my implant in, believe it or not, actually, uh, this is just a piece of arthroflex graft. Um, I, I don't know how things are for you, but uh, uh, you can't use any type of xenograft material. Uh, insurances won't cover that, but they'll they'll cover allograft materials. Um, so graft jacket or arthroplex graft um, are both human dermis, and they seem to insurances don't seem to bulk at that. Whereas if you use one of the other porcine or bovine uh, grafts, um, they'll kick it back to you. Um, so, so what I do is after I put an implant, I actually take it and I wrap it under the head and then I'll actually take it and wrap it back over. So I'm basically creating a, a interpositional arthroplasty for my sesamoids. And then I just cut it off and there it is sutured. Now I understand what's going to happen is, is this is just going to completely erode off. I don't care. Um, all I really care is I get, it's, it's, it's just a nice way to get, um, uh, graft material between my sesamoids uh, uh, and my metatarsal head because nobody, as you know, has come up with a good answer for sesamoid arthritis. But this seems to work pretty good. This is actually a piece of graft jacket wrapped around uh, instead of the arthroplex. Um, but it's the same thing. It's it's how I address uh, sesamoid arthritis. And this was the whole uh, uh, picture on uh, uh, changing and getting rid of the cannula for the phalangeal side. Uh, and making it a more coarse uh, base so it would have better uh, uh, ingrowth uh, to try to get rid of those few. Uh, I probably have seen in the past two years uh, out of probably 200 cases uh, of total toe, I think I've seen now five where the phalanx is loosened. And it's all been very, very active people. Um, uh, two of them are actually uh, still running. Um, and that's where I saw it. And the idea is maybe, and we always saw it start right at the tip. So we thought maybe that was one of the problems. So we got rid of that. So that that part's there. And I'm going to uh, just show you some cases that I've done. I, make sure you don't have any questions before I go anymore. Uh, are you, do you have any age restrictions, you know, from a, on the younger side uh, where you yeah. won't put these in from a longevity standpoint or? No, believe it or not, um, we're we're all we're, if they're really young, like we're talking in their you know late twenties or thirties, um, I won't do a total toe. What I've found is I do a hemiarthroplasty, and I tell them, look, in about fifteen years, if you keep running, um, you, you know your your other side's going to wear. And they're like, well, then what happens? I'm like, well, then I can convert it to a, a total toe. But uh, I don't. If somebody tells me that they still want to run or jog. I, I'm I'm a little nervous. It's just like you know us with total knees, and somebody says I still want to do, you know, ridiculous uh, things. But I can tell you with the hemiarthroplasty, I, I had one woman uh, 
who's about eight years out, who just came in because she won the Tough Mother her, uh, huh. competition uh -huh. here in Pittsburgh, and she's like, I love you, blah, blah, blah. Um, so I found the hemiarthroplasties uh, hold up really, really well. The total toes, I'm, I'm a little nervous about younger people or um, you know, people who still want to run. And that's just kind of how I address it. Gotcha. Yeah. The reason I ask, I got a gentleman that's in my clinic for a, he's got a cartilage defect on his first met, or on his metatarsal head. And um, I'm trying to figure out what to do with him next just because he's continued to be painful and, uh, you know, didn't want to do Cartiva or anything up front, but I think he's going to need something else just because he's failed everything else. So I, it's something to keep in the back of my mind. He's a big African American gentleman. There's no running in his future, but he is a, guy that's just trying to be active and continue working um and so if i can't get him under control i was just trying to think of other options but i think it's something to it seems like a good option in terms of your outcomes from what you've shown in terms of longevity as well yeah and and i will tell you i, I think for someone who's really active like that and this is just my own personal experience i think the hemicap works better and here's why because people who are going to really beat it up um they still get dorsal impaction um and and so what's going to happen is is there's still my experience been the cartiva doesn't really stop that and so they they still come in and they get pain because they're trying to run when you put in the hemicap that post uh kind of cush uh, stops them having the pain of dorsal impaction um because the the post kind of uh, almost prevents it so someone like that i actually go straight to the hemicap um, because I know they're still going to have pain as their balance impacts against their met head. Um, so that would be a person I would do. A yeah, uh, sure. And that's just been my experience that they, they do very well with that. Um, and, and they, they accept that they understand that, you know, you can, um, you, you can do that, but you know, over time, your phalanx is, is not going to tolerate it. And about, it's been my experience that, that usually somewhere between, 12 and 15 years they they come in and they need something done to the phalangeal side a couple times believe it or not i've actually just gone in and, and done a little interpositional uh, arthroplasty um and that's worked well and some other times i've converted them total toe and that's worked really well and i have a couple of those in fact those are the case i'm going to show you okay all right so this is actually the first one this is a woman um uh, who and this is actually what you see after about 10 to 12 15 years somewhere in there what happens is you start seeing the phalanx actually wearing along with the shape and so the toe gets a little bit shorter um it, it starts what happens is you they still get that dorsal impaction so you see the toe just starting to come up compared to the other ones because they're losing a lot of that dorsal um uh impaction but the nice thing is is you can literally go in and I'm telling you, the, the metatarsal sides, I, I've just not seen them fail. In fact, every time somebody showed me loosing, I said, go in and culture, because I've not seen this side uh, get into trouble yet. Um, this is a side where I'll usually see a little bit of uh, lucency or lysis in this area. And I'm hoping getting rid of that cannula is going to get rid of that. But yeah, here's a, uh, apologize on the lateral, it's uh, kind of light. Um, but it's a nice way, so you can literally get them back out to their length, and they're, they're really happy, and it just gives them a new surface. But that—that's what you see. This is a kind of a classic. Um, after after about ten years, somewhere between ten and fifteen years, you start seeing a little bit of wear here, a little bit of shortening, and a little bit of elevation, and it's always the phalangeal side. Because I mean, you can see the metatarsal side is still very well fixed, and all I do is go in and pop in the phalangeal side, and it works well. And that's just one case. So this is. As I told you, I like to really push the limits on it. Um, and, and so I, I love to see what I can get away with on this. So, you know, almost anyone would say, you know, you're insane, just going to fuse it. But, um, you know, here's the lateral, you know, the classic huge spur on the AP, you can see just severe erosion of the head and, and developing the health valgus uh, because of the erosion. But the neat thing is you, you literally can go in and I just put that, make sure that the, um, uh, that that components right down the middle of the shaft and I can recreate the surfaces and this is where I put the pin down and I literally I don't care what this part looks like 
I make sure that my pins down the center on the AP and the lateral. And and that's when uh, I just I put it right down. I basically create a new surface and then I, uh, here's my defect and then I fill it with cement and this is calcium phosphate cement. Um, and, and that's kind of what it looks like when you're done. Um, <clears throat> so uh, basically um, that's kind of looks like so. This is an interesting one because this is a nurse who came to see me and uh, she actually had this as her deformity. Um, and a couple of people offered a fusion and I, you can probably see why most people said <laughs> that, right, let's do a fusion. Uh, but she had heard I do joints and she wanted to try a joint knowing, you know, this was pretty bad. So. I, uh, you could see the head's pretty eroded, it's doors flex, but it was just arthritis. She had no gout, she had no rheumatoid. And I said, all right, let's give it a try. Both sides. Um, and uh, uh, that's kind of a lateral. And then what was really neat is she, she actually took these pictures for me. Um, this is her actually at six weeks. Um, and you could see the, the toe from the, the side view. And this was her right at six weeks. She took these pictures from home to show me what she can do at six weeks. She was so excited. And you see, you can you can get away with quite a bit. Um, uh, this is a non-union case. So this is just another indication if you want to try it. This was done by another orthopedic surgeon and actually perfectly well done conical reaming, but the uh, it went on to non-union. Um, and you can see non-union and had pain, but he said, you know, I hate the stiffness. Uh, is there anything you can do? And so uh, the orthopedic guy sent him to me and said, what do you want to give it a try? And I said, sure. As long as the sesamoids aren't involved in the fusion, if it's a simple conical reaming and the sesamoids aren't involved in the fusion, I'll actually take it apart. And, and that's kind of what it looks like. Um, this is actually, uh, that's for non-unions, but for, um, this woman, next one I'm gonna show you a little crazy, but um, she was a, a runway model and uh, uh, she was in her mid forties and somebody fused her toe and uh, she was absolutely miserable. She hated it and they sent her to me and uh, she said, I don't want a fusion, I can't do it. They even, if you'll notice, they even elevated her, her joint um, so that she'd go in the, uh, in the more high heel shoes and she hated it. So I actually, went in and took it apart and um, uh, gave her a joint. She did well. This is the only thing though, this was back in the day, uh, you're talking about uh, eight, eight years ago. And um, so what I did, they did the tightrope, but as you, and initially she did well. And unfortunately then the tightrope failed. She went into a little bit of valgus. Um, and uh, uh, that's actually why I, uh, you could see she, her TMT joint started to become a little bit uh, unstable and didn't really appreciate that hypermobility until later. And I actually just went back in and I, I don't have a picture to show you, but uh, it, it un, uh, I had to unfuse it. And, and I don't want to go through all this because this is all about the kiss lock. And I, had, I that's up to you. I'll talk to you about it. But it, it's basically the arthrosurface uh, answer to why the KISS law, to the tightrope and why it failed because um, George Holmes up in Chicago uh, and I talked a lot about why the tightropes were failing. Um, but this is just kind of a neat technique because we, we, we all knew that one focal point with a, a real tight suture like a banjo string, that fiber wire uh, doesn't work as well. So have two points of fixation uh, with a, an arrow and a button, and then you can reduce the intermeditarsal angle, and it gets rid of all the problems because you use a one, it's kind of the one one technique. It's a uh, self locking, self cinching, so essentially a knotless uh, technique way to reduce the IM angle. And and I'm not going to go through it. I, I, I don't know if you want me to go through all the kiss lock stuff, but usually when I teach this course, uh, we talk about it. That's up to you. Um, you just want to talk more about total toes, we can do that, but um, these, this is all just teaching that I do on how to do the, the kiss block. Um, but it's neat because uh, I'll show you a neat technique. 
Um, you're going to see a little bit more about this in the future. But when I do my bunions, I'll shave the uh, how I do my lapidus because everybody talks about lapoplasty. But when I do a bunion, I'll shave the medial eminence. I do my soft tissue release, and then I'll fire one of these things in. And what it does is it reduces my M angle pretty neat. And then uh, I can use this as uh, instead of using a lapoplasty guide, I actually just put this on. And basically, what I do is I reduce my M angle. But what's really neat is then I'll come back. Uh, I'm going to skip through this, but what I actually is I'll actually just scrape the joint and bone graft here, and it's my this is my version of a lapidus because it, uh, lapoplasty is because I don't need all that extra fixation. But I, that's just a technique. I'm not going to go too much into. It. So how are you it's utilizing the grip lock for so like me being from the Grand Rapids with you know, Bohe and Anderson, where everybody's first EMT is unstable, so therefore they get their version of the modified lapidus with four screws. Um, okay. And so I'm, I'm typically able to reduce that intermediate angle there. Are you using the kiss lock any other way outside of if you're, you know, doing a lapidus for correction for the correction of the IM angle? Or is it just to prevent putting a cross through across the one to two intermediate or getting a correction otherwise? Yeah, that's that's really what it is for me. Is anytime I want to reduce the one-two angle, um, okay. that's what I use it for. And I, I've used it to augment uh, distal chevrons. Uh, I've used it for this lapidus technique. Um, uh, uh, that's really what I use it for. Th that's really the major use for me. Is the yeah, that's that's kind of what I do. But I found that that's that's what I use it for. I use it as my reduction for my IM angle. Um, and then nice thing is it holds it. But the other thing is, uh, uh, you know, one of my partners, he still does uh, a, 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 a first metatarsal into the end of, uh, middle, cone middle coneiform. Um, I personally find that when you use a screw to go across here, it, it makes one, one two, too rigid. So I, I, I like a suture because it lets a little bit of that sagittal plane motion to occur. Um, so same idea with like a tightrope for the. Um for the syndesmosis, like it's absolutely, it's, it's that that's what the mini tightrope was designed for. Was the same concept as reducing the syndesmosis. Uh, I just found that that when I use this, it works really really well um, because I've seen a few lapis fail, and this uh, basically idea is to hold the one two angle so that if you do get some intracaneiform instability, it still right. holds. Okay. But I have not. The nice thing about by using this. I've probably used it a couple hundred times, and I haven't seen the stress fractures that you used to see with the mini tightrope because the mini tightropes you, you really yeah, had a, a and, 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 and we all saw that fail. This seems to work pretty well for that. Where I use it the most, um, you know, I use it for my bunions. But the other thing I've seen sometimes, and this is something you, you should know. Um, when when I have somebody, you know, and I go in and I do their total toe, so they have, you know, this bad arthritis and I, I push the limits. What I do is at the end of my case, after I put my my toe in, um, what I do then is I'll, I'll, I'll get a quick weight bearing simulated x-ray. I put my hand here and put pressure down like they're bearing weight. As long as my sesamoid sit there and it looks good, I'm done. Uh, but then the other thing I'll do is I'll, um, uh, dorsiflex the toe. So I'll show you that in a second. As I'm dorsiflexing the toe, a lot of times you'll actually see that uh, it's wanting to shift into valgus. And I think it's tight adductors or it's really in my bigger deformities. And then what I'll do is if, if I'm dorsiflexing and I see it doing that, and you can see how it really shifts out of alignment sometimes, then I'll go in and I'll put the kiss lock distally and and, and just like you were doing a distal mini tightrope between one and two. And then what I find is that holds it really nicely. So even when you dorsiflex, it, it maintains its alignment. And that's, that's one of my major uses for the kiss lock is if I get into a case where I've, I've started, um, and I'll show you, um, you know, this one even is as bad as a lot of my other ones. But um, if I start doing my weight bearing and then I push up, and I see it drifting a little bit, and I dorsiflex more, and I see it going out. I know this person's going to go on to get hallux valgus and be miserable. 
So that's when I'll go in and I'll just throw in a, a kiss lock. And I found that works really, really well. Um, and it's pretty simple to do um, to, to hold their reduction and, and keep them from getting into hallux valgus. Um, and, and this is just another example of a person who had uh, one side started to wear out the other side. And then you put it in and you see them drifting a little bit of valgus and you just throw a tight rope for uh, this kiss lock in and it holds it pretty nice. And then they are post-op. And, and here's an interesting one. So this woman was a, an engineer, um, had really bad health issues on one side, not so bad on the other, but she absolutely, she was only five foot two and said, I'm not getting a fusion. And so uh, I went in and I ended up doing a, a tightrope uh, or a kiss lock with a total toe. And this is the funniest part. She comes in at three weeks. She said, if you fix it, I'll come in in high heel shoes. And this is honest to God, you can see the stereo strips are still there. Um, she walked in with this shoe on at three weeks and, and I laughed so hard. I said, let's get a picture of it. And that's actually her in, in her shoe uh, with her motion um, in, in her tie rope. So, I mean, for me, it works. I, I push a lot of the limits on it, but I think it's a great way to go. Um, I definitely don't do a, um, I definitely don't do a total toe in a, a young a runner or anything like that. I would do the hemiarthroplasty. Um, I found the Cartiva works better in the uh, focal defects in the less active uh, businessman or woman who really just wants to put on their shoe and be comfortable. But for high impact people, I've found that the Cartiva just doesn't hold up and they still get impaction. Um, for me, uh, you know, this is just. Uh, like I said, I have 14 years of experience with it now. I've been real pleased with it. Um, and uh, there's a lot, a lot of tricks that we can go with. The only thing I can't answer is why the difference between a one and two millimeter polyethylene uh, changes your dorsiflexion so much. So if you see it and know that it's proud, can you then readjust yep. to get deeper? Absolutely. All It's really simple. All you got to do is uh, for every quarter turn of your, your taper post, you, in, you okay. go one millimeter deeper. So like if gotcha. I saw this and I said, oh, I'm two millimeters proud, I would literally turn, go take my post, turn it, it uh, half turn, and that would countersink me two millimeters. And then I would have to ream, uh, I put my guide wire back in, ream over top to, so that my implant would see two millimeters deeper. But that's all. That's, okay. I'm just okay. absolutely sure that this is nice and smooth. 